Um, so good morning. Uh, when they asked me to host this panel about machine learning, I was really excited because uh, like many of you, I was first attracted to Spark uh, because of its uh, ability to handle machine learning workloads. So here to join me this morning are two of the main uh, people behind Apache Spark. Uh, first, we have Ion Stoika, the chairman of Databricks and also professor at UC Berkeley Rice Lab. And uh, we also have Matei Saharia, who is the chief technologist of Databricks, assistant professor at Stanford, and one of the founders of the Stanford Dawn Project. So please welcome uh, Ion and Matei. All right, so we promise to be, make this a friendly conversation. So. Um, so actually, before we jump into machine learning, since you guys are here also representing your respective schools, uh, maybe you can uh, tell this community, are there any specific projects you're working on that uh, they may benefit from, so the, that plugs into the Spark uh, ecosystem that uh, it aren't quite yet uh, released? Um, yeah, so at, uh, at Berkeley, um, I'm leading Rice Lab, which follows AMP Lab. And the lab is really focusing on uh, making intelligent decisions in a constantly changing environment. And uh, what does this mean is to make decisions which are uh, not only smart, but are secure, are robust, and um, are explainable. So, you know, if you make a decision, the machine makes a decision which affects you, you want to understand why the decision was made. That's very important for many businesses. Um, and in this uh, context, we are working on a bunch of projects which are within the Spark ecosystems or the, are expanding Spark ecosystem. So hopefully I can touch on a few of them um, during this uh, dialogue. So, Matei. Yeah, so, um, so I um, uh, joined Stanford last fall, and I'm actually working um, on a new uh, lab there uh, that is specifically focused on usable machine learning. So uh, what infrastructure do we need to make it easier to use machine learning in production applications with, uh, with a lot less effort than today? Uh, it's a lab called Dawn. It's also the lab that Chris Ray, who you saw present uh, yesterday, is part of, along with, uh, with two other faculty members. And some specific things we're working on so you saw Chris's project Snorkel, which is basically a different interface for labeling data at scale that requires uh, much less human effort. Uh, I'm also working on projects for fast serving and inference, uh, and also on uh, uh, basically code generation and running computations from Spark or, or from other uh, data processing frameworks on uh, parallel hardware, such as GPUs and FPGAs. So let's get back to those uh, projects uh, in in a minute, but uh, let's set uh, kind of a baseline. So how would you two characterize the state of machine learning in Spark right now? Um, I think there are a lot of innovation out there. You know, it's, it's super hot, AI is super hot. What we are really happy about is that we are seeing a lot of innovations happening in the Apache Spark ecosystems. Um, and there are many examples along these lines. You, you saw yesterday uh, Big DL from uh, Intel, which is part of the Apache Spark uh, stack. Uh, basically, you have XGBoost, which runs on, uh, on top of Apache Spark. Uh, you have um, also, of course, TensorFlows, and many users of TensorFlows actually leverage today uh, Spark. And this should come as no surprise. Uh, because Spark emerged as a de facto standard for big data processing, and much of the rapid progress in the AI over the past few years is down to the ability to process larger and larger amounts of data. I think the other aspect, uh, which Matei alluded to uh, earlier, and also in his key keynote, um, we are really focusing on, both at our universities at Databricks, on um, dramatically simplify uh, AI, you know, bring the power of AI to everyone. And we do so by seamlessly integrating the state of the art uh, AI and deep learning libraries uh, into Spark uh, by providing AI APIs 
across existing components in the Apache Spark, like SparkSQL, and improving the performance. And here I want to mention one of the projects we are working in the context of the Rice Lab, uh, Drizzle. And you may have heard about Drizzle. It was presented at the past summit. And Drizzle not only is going, you know, is reducing the streaming latency. Um, similarly, like you saw yesterday, Michael Arburst do, you're doing in his demo, showing in his demo, but also is going to significantly improve the machine learning, uh, we're going to speed up the machine learning workloads by up to 10x. Yeah, so just to add on to what Jan said, I think for um, distributed machine learning, uh, Spark is often the platform of choice. Uh, even uh, a lot of the frameworks, for example, to run TensorFlow and Keras at scale, the most usable frameworks like the, the TensorFlow and Spark framework uh, from Yahoo uh, or various distributed Keras ones uh, run on top of Apache Spark. Uh, if, you know, if, if I were to, to sort of um, criticize the, the project a little bit, I'd say one thing is uh, Spark Spark has only really focused on the distributed use cases, but a lot of users uh, want to use the same tool on a single machine while developing and also at scale. So that's actually something that I think the community is, uh, is, is very aware of, and uh, uh, people are working to uh, make it much easier to run on a laptop, because the idea is, you know, instead of you know, having to run a separate data frame library or something like scikit-learn on your laptop that's usually single-threaded and that's different from what you have on the cluster, just make it easy enough to run the same stuff. And uh, we think that we can, uh, we can get there um, you know, over time. That's good to know, because obviously you, you guys are preaching to the choir here. But uh, <laughs> uh, in the larger data science community, there's these older libraries like scikit-learn, even R, and of course, uh, newer libraries like TensorFlow and a bunch of other deep learning frameworks. So given that Spark ML hasn't really caught up in terms of algorithms and functionality. What do you see as Spark's role moving forward in, in the larger machine learning uh, um, landscape? I, I think that's a great question. And uh, just let me start with uh, saying that um, developing and running machine learning algorithms is just a small part uh, in building uh, AI-based service or product. The rest is data ingestion, data processing, um, featureization, and so forth. So actually, because of that, AI plays already a fundamental role in these AI-based products and services. And I really we see, I, you know, I think that this role will dramatically in, in, uh, you know, increase as we are going to focus on adding more functionality, uh, integrating with the best of the breed uh, in terms of uh, uh, libraries, uh, deep learning libraries, and so forth, uh, improving the performance in, in, in Spark, both for the distributed and, Mat like Matei mentioned, uh, for the single node, um, and uh, also adding new, new functionality. And, um, you know, for instance, uh, one uh, along these lines, one of the projects we are working on, it's actually uh, Tegra, which um, is targeting the time evolving graphs. Uh, so most of the systems today are on the latest graph uh, snapshot. They process the, large, uh, the latest graph snapshot. Uh, Tegra, what will allow you is to perform ad hoc queries on arbitrary snapshot in the past. Uh, Tegra is actually built on uh, top of graphics, so it allows you to ask questions like, which are your friends two years ago, like in, in June 7, 2015. Uh, more importantly, it will bring the um, window-based and streaming functionality to graph processing in uh, Apache Spark. So you can ask questions such as, how did your circle of friends evolve over the past six months? So we are going very excited about, excited about all these projects and uh, about the community and, again, using the best of read. Actually, before you answer, Mate, so I'll, uh, I'm happy to hear that you guys are working on the, uh, making Spark ML run on a, a laptop. But beyond that, can you talk about, so since we're entering kind of this AI mm -hmm. uh, era, how about hardware acceleration? 
Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, in terms of uh, you know running on heterogeneous hardware, it does seem that that will be essential for both training and for serving uh, machine learning models in you know at, at a realistic scale. So basically, uh, the story now is if you have a lot of data, you can build these large models with lots of parameters, and you'll get better results. But suddenly, it becomes expensive to evaluate those models. Um, so there's already quite a bit of work in Spark to make it easy to uh, use these types of devices and, and use heterogeneous hardware. In particular, all the tungsten work moved most of the data outside of uh, the Java heap into a format that's easy to pass into these native libraries. And so, for example, the Spark ML library al already uses BLAS underneath. It can use optimized implementations like uh, uh, Intel MKL and so on. Uh, and uh, the, the deep learning pipelines uh, library you saw yesterday can use both those and GPUs. It, uh, all of, both of those things are possible. Um, I do think that uh, in the future we may need to extend the API with more explicit ways to manage these devices. Right now it's kind of done in an ad hoc fashion, but I do think it's, uh, uh, it, it's definitely like basically two or three years ago when we started Spark SQL, this is exactly you know, the kind of thing we wanted to target. So actually, uh, uh, we're talking about machine learning, but advanced analytics broadly defined uh, uh, includes certain data types and data formats. Uh, so what, what, is Spark, what is the Spark community doing about things like, say, natural language processing, time series analysis, Eon alluded to graphs, but things like uh, NLP, which uh, seems like a natural thing for Spark to do, right? So rather than bringing in another library. Hmm. Yeah, I can I can um, uh, take that. So um, so there are actually a lot of really cool community uh, projects that have to do with new types of data, uh, and uh, actually we're also learning a little bit about how to support lots of these projects with the core APIs. So for example, for NLP, there's a, a system, a, a library called Spacey, which is uh, bringing large-scale NLP on top of Spark. Um, something else really exciting that actually came out of the AMP lab before is the Atom project for genomics. So in genomics. Uh, if, you're, if you're familiar uh, with, uh, with the tool chain there, there are these very specialized file formats where people came up with ways to compress, say, DNA sequencing data or variant calls or other types of uh, data that they have. And uh, in the AMP lab, a group there tried just replacing these formats with Parquet, basically, with Apache Parquet. And they found they get not much better, uh, not only uh, better compression, uh, but also a much faster processing because it's a columnar format. So now this is a widely used uh, uh, format for these things. So let me press you on uh, one point. So you mentioned Spacey. Yeah. Um, is there any specific effort to make sp the Spacey integration even easier? I think in general, in, in the project itself, uh, uh, at least the, the ML team at Databricks is, is working on um, uh, really simplifying the, the pipeline component API for creating transformers and estimators so that it's easy to plug those in. It's still kind of difficult to do that uh, if your library is in Python, for example. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're trying to do. Uh, and we, we do try to make this uh, modular so people can develop stuff outside. Uh, and I think it's, it's possible to get there. I think we, uh, you know, if, if we can achieve that, it'll be a really good place for the project. Yeah. So you mentioned Tegra, which is graphs. Yeah. So what's the ti what's the timeline? <laughs> um, so we, we hope to release the first version in, in the fall. At least as a plan. Um, and it, it's again to it's not much to add what to Mate, what Matei said. But I think that if you take a step back, you see again two trends. There are two trends. Uh, one is that as Spark becomes more and more popular, you see. Um, researchers and practitioners uh, in other fields using Spark to deploy and implement their algorithms. Uh, this happens also uh, machine learning in uh, natural language processing at Berkeley and elsewhere. At the same time, the second trend is that you see all these other systems which may have been, de been developed outside Spark, um, people integrated, and clearly we are going to push uh, very hard in making this integration and as easy as possible. So it's again, Apache Spark is fundamentally an open ecosystem. Um, so it's about providing people with the best tools, the access to the best tools in the easiest possible way. But I'm here to lobby for a native NLP library in Spark. <laughs> <laughs> um, Make it happen. So 
if you look at surveys and talk to people, the main bottleneck for machine learning is two things, right? So as Chris Ray probably alluded to, training data is the new, new oil. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, model deployment and model uh, monitoring and production. Yeah. So are, are you in your respective uh, universities working on any projects that will yeah. make this easier? Yeah. So um, I, I think these are, these are great points. And uh, obviously, these are problems. You know, at universities, we are about uh, addressing uh, problems and you know, challenges, developing solutions. It's what uh, we believe we are good at in general. Um, and two projects I want to mention, which are uh, focusing on addressing some of these challenges, uh, we, are, we are working in the context of Rice Lab, are, uh, uh, it's uh, ground, our ground and uh, clipper. So ground, uh, it's a data context service uh, which uh, allows application and users to understand what is their data, um, who is using the data, how the data has been changed and when, uh, where the data is coming from, who, is, who has created the data, who has deleted the data. And early applications uh, of uh, ground are uh, like uh, global data inventory for enterprises across multiple data sets. And the reason this is so important is because Again, much of our insights, uh, much of the value of the data, it's in the ability to process a lot of data, and this data is in a lot of storage formats and in a lot of storage systems. Um, so you need to unify that access, you need to unify that understanding. Um, another, um, the, uh, the other use case is about life cycle uh, management for machine learning models. Uh, the second project which is related with this is Clipper, which is a prediction and a model serving system uh, which will make super easy for uh, users to deploy the models in productions, scale them up, uh, monitor and manage them. And uh, Clipper is the first model serving system to fully support um, models created in Apache Spark. And I'm happy to say that both of these uh, systems have been just released in the open source, early releases, but we will be delighted if you can check them out, give us feedback, and help in improving them. Yeah, yeah. So to go uh, to go back to uh, Ben's question, you know, he asked. Uh, in, he said, in practice, you know, the bottlenecks for machine learning are actually just getting training data and uh, and then uh, deploying and, and monitoring production applications. And that's exactly the theme uh, that um, that we have in the Dawn project. So basically, our our hypothesis there is, is is that machine learning algorithms themselves are already good enough for most use cases. There's not much um, you, you you can do to make them a lot. Better. But the real problem, and when you talk with people at uh, any scale, like anywhere from the web companies to an enterprise setting to scientists at Stanford trying to, uh, you know, to look at medical data, uh, the real problem is really just preparing the data, uh, achieving a high quality pipeline, especially if the data updates over time, uh, and feeding that into the model. And then after that, once you've done that, you know, you pick one of several algorithms, you train it, it's good. Uh, and then after that, the second problem that happens is how do you deploy it? You know, how, how does it become not just a demo you do once, but something you can actually rely on to do things like diagnosing patients or driving your car or things like that? Uh, and the interesting thing about this is the ML research community doesn't really work on these two phases because, uh, I mean, of course, some people do, but it's, 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 it's very heavily centered around benchmarks like ImageNet, where you already have a pristine data set. So there's this mismatch where all the, all the smart researchers are only focusing on this part, and of course they've made that part really good, the training part, but then when you talk to any practitioner, everyone tells you that actually is the stuff before and after. So uh, we think that there are pretty big leaps to be made there, even just by getting more people to pay attention to those stages. So we're almost out of time, but I do want uh, to be able to ask you to look to the future, so keep your answer short. Um, as someone who spent time in, with the AI community, it's clear that uh, some of their workloads have very different requirements in terms of throughput and latency. So are you working on any systems that will specifically target AI applications? So now you can talk about things you're working on that are beyond Spark. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So from uh, you know from my lab, we're, we're working on a, a system called Weld, which is a way uh, to generate very efficient uh, data parallel code from uh, uh, you know from from uh, either a, a serving pipeline or a training pipeline uh, and run it on uh, on heterogeneous hardware, on GPUs and FPGAs and so on. So uh, the whole idea is to uh, give you this kind of composable API that you get in in Spark, uh, but uh, be able to generate very good code for this type of hardware. And um, uh, we think this approach will, uh, will go pretty far. And it's actually, we're pretty sure that the approach will work because we've already kind of done this in Spark using data frames and Spark SQL and uh, Catalyst Optimizer. So this is just an extension of that. Uh, you know, that's very likely to actually somehow integrate with Spark as well. Yeah, so one, one of the things we are really focusing uh, on uh, in the RICE lab is, like I mentioned early on, it's about building systems which can uh, continuously learn and interact with the changing environment. Uh, one particular uh, focus area is reinforcement learning, um, which is a technique which actually was a key technique, one of the key techniques used by Google's AlphaGo, uh, which, as you know, beat the Go world champion um, last year. And uh, for this, we are, because it, it, it does have a uh, a few different requirements. One of the requirements to perform a huge number of micro simulations, um, we are building a new system called Ray, and it was a presentation here yesterday. And Ray is going is going to integrate in the Apache Spark ecosystem and uh, making that integration easier and smoother is one of the priorities of the project. So we're out of time. So. Check out these two projects. They're both out uh, on some level of maturity, but uh, they're both very cool. So Weld and Ray. Thank you. Thank you.